What are going? I'm Ali Atkinson from Jamaica. Hi, I'm Duncan Scott. Hey, this is Freya Anderson. This is Andres Vazayas. Hi, this is Rob Woodhouse. Hi, I'm Mel Marshall, and this is the London Raw podcast. Hello, and welcome to the first London Raw podcast covering the second season of the International Swimming League. I'm Steve Buckley from poolboy.co.uk. Usually you'd hear us on the Pool Boy podcast, and I've got my usual companions from that with me today. So uh, that's uh, former GB swimmer Casey Wilde and swimming commentator extraordinaire Bob Ballard. So (laughs) we're going to get into a bit of a preview of the second season of the International Swimming League and take a look at the London Raw chances for that. But first of all, Bob, uh, it's great to just have some swimming to talk about. Isn't it just, I mean, all these months now, we have waited and waited and waited and thinking, well, that looks like we're going to have to write off the whole of 2020. And it's I sell to the rescue, really, because we have something at last to get our teeth into. And uh, the swimmers, if we're feeling that, must be feeling it even more so, that finally they've got a chance to race each other, which they've not had. Obviously, they thought they'd be in Tokyo doing it a couple of months ago. This is the first chance they've had. And how important, Katie, for the swimmers, as Bob says, because you no, know, we had no trials, we had no Olympics. Uh, it's a chance for them to get back in and compete and uh, and test themselves against you know, the best swimmers in the world. Yeah, it's great that so many swimmers from different nations are really bought into it. And you've ended up with this bubble just, you know, basically full of the, the world's best swimmers. So it should be an absolutely brilliant competition. And I think we've sort of been starved of sport for so long. Um, I'm definitely really looking forward to it. Well, I've been getting increasingly excited watching all of the Instagram posts from the swimmers uh, getting into Budapest and going into the bubble there ahead of the competition starting this weekend. Um, We are looking a lot at London Raw. They arrived um, uh, into into Budapest yesterday and went into their quarantine there. Uh, They've they've kept a lot of the team um, from last year. They've added some some more swimmers to it. Uh, Bob, how do you make... uh, How do you rate... How do you rank their chances uh, for this season? We certainly can't discount energy, but London look strong, maybe even a little bit stronger than they did last year. They've recruited well. We'll hear from a little later on about why they've gone for what they've got. But it's got the feel of a very much a Mel Marshall team. As you you look down the list of people in there, she's gone with uh, her bankers in many ways. She's gone... And back to the Brits, 15 Brits on the list, which is great to see. Everybody get a, a chance to race in there. And a lot of people, I think, uh, who didn't get a chance last year will really step up to the plate this year. I think um, as it's, it's a good-looking, all-round, pretty strong team. You might say sprint freestyles are a little bit weak, potentially, but everything else, most of the bases seem to be covered. Well, you said there they've got uh, 11 of, of last year's team back with them. It would have been more uh, apart from the loss of the Australian contingent. Uh, six swimmers with ISL experience coming in from other teams from last year. So they've recruited across the, the board and 13 swimmers making their ISL deb- debut um, this year. Uh, Katie, any team is going to suffer losing losing the Australian contingents and, and without meaning any disrespect to those that have come in, uh, any team is going to suffer losing three world champ- uh, sorry three olympic champions uh, and a world record holder yeah i think it's it's a particularly tough loss for london raw because they had heavily recruited from australia and i think it, it is it's an awful lot to ask of people to step up when you know not only you're missing quite a few people but those people you are missing are such heavyweights um you know it, the the Campbell sisters and Emma McKeon gave us a, a sort of almost undefeatable relay lineup um, and, and Kyle Chalmers is such a big name for the men. Um, it is really tough, but I also think um, it's it's such an exciting competition to be part of. We saw some really, really big swims from people last year. And although Minna Atherton, for example, was a name in swimming, she came out of the ISL a much bigger name. And I think um, some of the new people who've joined the London Raw will be looking to, to make a name for themselves in the same way. I think it offers opportunities um, to sort of make a name for yourself in, in quite a fun way at a great competition and for swimmers to make a bit of money at the same time, which is something that they haven't had the opportunity to do that often. I actually think Minna Athen is a big loss. I mean, you, you talk about those you know, well-established superstars of Australian swimming, but Minna Athen, having seen her at the World Juniors last year, just looks like a complete superstar for the future. Her attitude's great. She gets in. She is a true 
an utter racer like her mum was. And uh, I think she, she will be a big loss to that team. Well, she was somebody who broke through uh, and really made a name for herself last year with the with the world record in the um, in the backstroke. Um, there could be obviously some names to break through, uh, and there may be some from from the the British team. I think somebody we've already seen a bit of Bob, who uh, we we were excited about anyway, but now has a chance really to show his his talent for everybody. Is Tom Dean? He's he's yes. probably a rising star. Yeah, and then he, he certainly is a rising star, and I think um, hopefully next year he'll get a chance to show it on the big stage at the Olympics because his improvement has been, yeah, I would say meteoric, but it's, it's been a very kind of gradual progression. He's come through, he's learned very quickly, he's adapted very quickly. Uh, we saw him put really under the microscope at the Worlds uh, just, just a year or so ago, but you know, he, he stepped up to the plate there. And I think he will be uh, one of those who will really thrive on this kind of environment too. And uh, a big change on the women's team, Katie, in the in the breaststroke swimmers with um, Annie Laser and, and Alia Atkinson, who were two of the top breaststrokers in the ISL last year coming in. That's that's a big statement on on improving that area of the team. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also shows that it's important to these swimmers to win and to to tactically think about the team that they want to be on to give themselves the best chance of being on a winning team and um, I think it is an area where we were perhaps a little bit weak last year um, but two really really strong additions to the team um, and I think if we had the chance to to select breaststroke on the women's side for the skins I think that would be an a- absolutely brilliant um, chance to get some good points on the board. Well one of the names that came in uh, after the the loss of the Australians um, was uh, Amory Laveau uh, from France, who's got massive experience. I mean, he was uh, an Olympic champion in the relay in 2012 for France. Uh, he's set world records short course. I mean, he's a, an amazing swimmer with a massive pedigree, but we've not seen him you know, swimming at the, the top level for a little while. He retired, he's come back. Um, Katie, do you think he's he's been picked on his experience, maybe, to, to help some of those younger guys? I think uh, there's a couple of points. I mean, I think the London Wall perhaps was looking a little bit um, weak on the on the sprint freestyle side. So it's always good to have someone with that ex- experience coming in. Um, I also think it's quite fun. He's, he's an unknown quantity a bit at this at this stage. Exactly as you said, because we haven't seen him race for a while. Um, but also, I think it's, it's great to have a bit more star power. I mean, there's plenty on there already, but you can never have too much, can you? Well, he'll, he'll either be... Uh, uh a bit of a gamble or an absolutely genius piece of recruitment, I think, but we will see when the swimming pans out. Um, looking a little bit, Bob, at the at the strengths and weaknesses of the team, we've touched on a few areas already. Obviously, uh, the, the team's totem, if you like, um, will be Adam Peaty once again. Yeah, I mean, there'd be so much expected of him and he invariably delivers, as we know, both our short course level and at long course as well. Um, I hope there's not too much pressure on his shoulders uh, there are enough people who can share the burden. James Guy is, you know, another person with loads of international experience now. Luke Greenbank could be one they'll be looking to to really get involved. Um, you know, he, he's had a couple of really good years, not obviously shown anything this year because nobody has, but Luke Greenbank will be in there too. And there's a good smattering of people like Prigida in there and uh, Guillaume and Dina. Um, but there's some, some some really, really strong European and overseas swimmers involved in that and i think it, it's it's a really nice collective mix um of people who've got great attributes that they bring to london raw i think and katie at the, at the london leg last year we spoke about the importance of having uh and people who are versatile who can swim across a number of different events uh one of those is duncan scott who uh who only swam two matches last year the final and, and the london leg and, and was i think one two three seventh highest scorer for for London or across the whole season, just off those two legs where we saw him swim, uh, the 50 freestyle skins, the 400 IM where he set a British record, you know, as well as his, his usual events in 100 and 200 free. Uh, having that kind of of, uh, of range in one swimmer is really important in this format. Yeah, I think, um, and, and as you'll hear Mel talk about a little bit later on, it is one of those competitions where sometimes people are going to be needed, needed to step up um, to do something that might they might not normally do in a major international competition. Um, 
but but I mean maybe it takes the pressure off these guys a bit because while when they get to the world championships or the Olympics you might find them doing one maybe two events and here they might find themselves you know swimming across five or six different events across the whole series um it's it is really great having having someone who can just turn their hand to a different event I think particularly given the COVID-19 situation as a team you need to be prepared um to expect the unexpected and take on an event that you might not otherwise do um and just try and get some points on the board for your team and i certainly get the impression steve that duncan scott is somebody who would who would at a moment's notice drop in for somebody who had to pull out so either an injury or somebody who didn't feel great was off form he would say yeah he put his hand up and he would do it every time well, we will talk a bit more about team culture because that's a, a very important part of this uh, later in this podcast. Sticking with uh, the, the changes and the strengths and the weaknesses um, and, and looking at an area that you know well, Katie, in terms of the women's sprint freestyle, we saw Freya Anderson uh, swim very well in the in uh, last year's ice for Aqua Centurion, but then went on from there to absolutely uh, you know, swim brilliantly at the, uh, the European Short Course Championship. So she's a big... Um, a big gain for London in in the sprint events, and um, also in there is Anna Hopkin, who who we know is a fantastic sprinter with with NT two A experience. So those are two girls who are going to make probably a bit of a difference in that area. Do you think? Yeah, I think absolutely. Obviously, it is it's tricky in that we've lost probably three of the best sprint freestylers in the world in the the Campbell sisters and Emma McKeon. But if you're gonna if you're gonna get two people to step up, then I think you couldn't really have done that much better than. Um, Freya and, and Anna Hopkin and um, the great thing about Freya is that she's actually great short course up to 400 free she's done a really impressive 400 free before so if we need her to step up in that then she might be able to do that um, Anna's sort of got a, a pure 50 and 100 focus um, I don't know if we'll see her in a 200 at any point but um, I, I think certainly having recruited the two of them it doesn't look like a weakness at all um, women's freestyle I think we're pretty strong there I'll also be keen to see what Emily Large does because she was a, a great talent, is a great talent, uh, has got loads of potential still. We haven't seen her realise that yet on the big stage. She was great for Newcastle, she was great in regional events. This is a kind of a breakout event potentially for her here? Well, it's certainly a chance for her to uh, to establish herself, uh, you know, in the senior field. She was a very good junior, as you say, uh, had lots of success there. So now hopefully she can build on that and uh, you know, being around you know, some great swimmers for six weeks, training closely with them, uh, seeing them, you know, in action, uh, hopefully will will do her a world of good, as it will you know, many of the other juniors who are in there. Um, we you've spoke we spoke then about um, about Freya and Anna. Katie, I think we already mentioned uh, Amory Laveau, but it would appear that, that the men's sprint freestyle is an area where the team hasn't moved on, perhaps in, in the way it might have done from last year when we had Kyle Chalmers last year, who won't be there uh, in Budapest this year. But the, the freestyle skins were in a bit of a bit of an Achilles heel uh, in the men's for uh, for London last year. And it probably, if it goes to freestyle again, probably the same thing is going to happen. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right. Although, you know, even though he's not a pure 50 freestyler, as you say, last year we had Duncan Scott um, stepping up and, and giving a pretty good account of himself in the skins. Um, Amory Laveau, we just have no idea at the moment. He could absolutely destroy it or he could manage one great 50 and then, you know, not be able to hang on for a couple more. I think given the chance it, to choose um, our stroke on skins, freestyle would probably not be it for the men's. Well, we've mentioned it a couple of times already that, that one of the rule changes that's come in is the fact that, uh, that the skin stroke is not fixed. It won't necessarily be freestyle uh, and will be picked another way. So let's have a little look at what happens uh, in that, uh, that rule change. And when we come back from that, we're going to speak to uh, the Raw General Manager, Rob Woodhouse and Head Coach Mel Marshall, who uh, gave us some time earlier today to tell us about putting their team together and what they're hoping to achieve this season. There's no doubt that the Skins events were pivotal in deciding the outcome of last year's ISL. In two matches, including the final, London Raw were overhauled by Energy Standard in the Skins. Well this year there's a twist, which also makes the medley relays much more important. London Roar winning the 4x100 medley relay. Win the medley relay and you get to choose the stroke for the closing Skins events, giving both a chance to get your best sprinters into the game and to nullify your opponent's strengths. 
London might go with Adam Peaty and choose breaststroke, or bank on Guido Guillaume to continue the backstroke dominance he showed last year. For the women, Elia Atkinson on breaststroke and the freestyle duo Anna Hopkin and Freya Anderson give good options. But with the Raw facing Callie Condors twice in the preliminary rounds, the choice might be as much about keeping the likes of Caleb Dressel and Lily King away from the skins as it is picking your best sprinter. One thing's for sure, it's going to add another layer of intrigue to team tactics in ISL2. My name is Amy Wilmot and you are listening to the official London Raw podcast. So we're joined from Budapest by General Manager Rob Woodhouse and Head Coach Mel Marshall. Uh, welcome to the podcast. And uh, Rob, must be great to finally get the team on the ground uh, in Budapest ahead of racing. Uh, yes, it is. I think there's a great excitement, everyone um, uh, joining the various flights from around the world. Um, the usual dramas and obviously, as with everything these days, it's um, it it's not, hasn't been an easy project, but uh, everyone's got here safe and sound. We've um, had another um, COVID test um, on arrival and everyone's got through that. So um, it's now about, um, I mean, today's a bit uh, bit of quarantine and just sort of getting settled. And then um, we, we hit the um, training pool tomorrow. We're ahead of our first match this week weekend this Sunday. And Mel, after a, after a summer of coaching people in their back gardens and houses and, and getting them back in the water, it must be it must be great to be looking forward to some proper competition. Yeah, it really is. And, um, you know, preparing for an Olympics in the middle of a pandemic in sport is a real, um, it's a real challenge. And um, I think this is the first glimmer of kind of normality that a lot of the athletes have had. You know, a lot of them are a year better than they were last year. A lot of them are a year fitter and they had nowhere to go and nowhere to, um, to, to house their work. So I think this is a really good opportunity for everybody. And I think that everybody that's worked hard to bring this together, governing bodies, the ISL, I think it's been a real mission. And I think um, the athletes are going to get to do what they've been desperate to do, which is race. I mean, you've both, both of you swum at the highest level in your own swimming careers, but never had this sort of opportunity. I mean, Mel, is this an event you would have loved to have swum in? Oh, my goodness, yeah. I mean, it's absolute, It's over in two hours. It's fast. It's furious. It's a team um, a team game. And I just think, yeah, absolutely brilliant. And the um, the show that's put on is, is spectacular. And I just think that, you know, we'll see some fast swimming here. And I think we'll see some people pushing on to new uh, bound pushing on to new um, boundaries and I think it'll be it'd be really exciting for everybody to actually just start to look at what we do again which is race and compete and from uh, from the athletes point of view Rob you've represented you no know, swimmers as as a manager for for many years is this is this you know this evolution and a great thing for the for the athletes in terms of their marketability and those kind of things yeah, it is. I think anyone and all of us, um, you know, we're, we're all invested in making the, uh, you know, promoting the sport and 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 uh, inspiring, you know, the young kids to 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 get into the elite level of the sport as well. So we all want to do this, and this is a great way of doing that. Um, the fact that this year the event's going to be televised, um, you know, on BBC, for example, and and other networks around the world, it, it gives all these. It's not just for the athletes themselves that are competing. It, it's it's for all the young up and comers and anyone that aspires to sort of get in a swimming pool and and and, um, and do a few laps because it's, it gives them something to watch and and someone to follow and so forth, which they've all been sadly missing all year. So this isn't just about the elite level of sport; this is about the sport itself. So you've got your team together in Budapest at last. Um, tell us a little bit about how you went about putting putting the squad together. I mean, you've got uh, eleven. Uh, members coming back from 2019 it would have been more um, if the Australian contingent had been able to compete uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that but uh, you obviously had you know another 19 slots that you filled subsequently how do you go about um, putting that together Rob? Um, it's a combination of a lot of things it's uh, it's obviously about having a good network amongst uh, not only coaches but also um, uh, federations and so on and just being keep an eye out and also watching last year's ISL results and, and getting to talk to people there um, Mel and um, and Tiggy Stephen Tigg certainly had um, a, a lot of input which was fantastic um, I think on paper um, our team 
was, well, I, I believe we had a team that was virtually unbeatable um, uh, until um, uh, the Australians had to withdraw. Um, but we've even from there, we've, uh, the, the uh, additions we've made, it's a lot of younger people. We've given a chance to quite a few of the British, the young up-and-coming British swimmers, which is a really good opportunity for them. But uh, we still believe it's a really strong team. But, you know, it's that combination of, uh, I guess, knowledge and experience, but also listening to the advice of experts like Mel, like Stephen Tigg and other coaches. Rob, quite a lot of the rules have changed since last year. Um, were you aware of all those rule changes when it came to recruiting for the team or did all that come in kind of a bit later on? Uh, a bit of a mix, Katie. It's, uh, uh, some we were aware uh, were happening and others we weren't. And um, as with everything, you go with the flow, you know, uh, even even to the location and so forth. I mean, we started recruiting the team um, when we, uh, you know, before the Olympics were postponed. So um, it was a, it's, a, it's a lot different scenario now being in Budapest than what it was when it was going to be spread across a number of different countries over a six-month period. So the recruiting, um, so we, we did adjust a little bit, but, um, you know, we, we've, we've done the best we can and uh, as I said I'm very comfortable we've got a good team um, and um, those rules um, they will certain, they will favour certain athletes um, they might disadvantage certain teams but I think you'll find that the, the strongest teams will probably get a little bit stronger Well you've got a lot of rookies going in this year what have you told them about the experience? Well I think the lane ropes are still 25 metre lane ropes still two metres and a half between each lane rope and there's still a block. So they've been doing swimming since they were eight. So I guess that's sort of the message that I'm going to say is, yeah, there'll be lights, yeah, there'll be superstars that you're racing against, but you can only control what you can control. So I think that's the thing is enjoy the experience and just, it's really simple. Is like, just give your best. That's all we can ask for. And then each round, just try and get a little bit better um, learn from each experience and, um, you know, don't be afraid of anybody. Just because you stood on the on the block next to Caleb Dressel, he's he's human. Last time I looked at him, he had two legs, two arms, two eyes, and a haircut. You know, we're all the same, really. So, I think it's um, never put anybody on a pedestal. Keep it simple and just give your best. We saw last year, and in, in listening to the swimmers, um, no, speaking last year, and then on social media this year, that. Uh, you built a really good team culture, Mel, last year, and everyone loved being part of that team and competing for their for their teammates and so on. Um, it was it important for you, or is it important for you to try and build that again this year? And it is the fact that you're sort of confined together in a hotel an advantage for that? Uh, yeah, I think um, the team spirit's everything. It's a as a coach, you try and look at where can we get ten percent from. Where where are the little wins? And I think that that team chemistry and that almost family bond that you can build over the duration can give you a 10% factor when it comes to the wire. I remember last year in Vegas, um, I bought the girls some socks and we had a bit of a girls meeting and we had Jeanette Otterson talking about having a baby and we had everybody standing up and having a bit of girl power and the girls on day two blew the roof off. So I just think that it's about if we can find a 10% factor by building a bit of a family unit, by caring about one another and actually getting a bit of chemistry, and actually not just swimming for me, but swimming for we, I think that's, um, that's definitely a game changer at this level. And I, did think, I do think that's something that we built well last year. I think that's why a lot of people have come back. I think Rob has a large amount to do with that. And I think the staff that we work with have a large amount to do with that because, um, you know, athletes at the front of everything we do and try and help and support them to do what they do. So it's, that team culture for me is everything. Did that have an impact on, on the recruitment? I mean, you know, if you think of... <clears throat> high performance teams like the All Blacks, they have a very, very strong culture. And was that something of, of what you were, were thinking of when you were, were when names were being thrown around? Well, I think it's there's a team fit and there's an event fit and there's a personality fit. But also we've got to remember that we do performance. And so um, I think it's making sure that all of those boxes are ticked and taking each athlete um, and each recruitment on a case-by-case basis. And I think that um, once you've got all of those parameters and you have a good quality conversation then you make your selections based on you know all of the information that you've got um we find ourselves again in olympic year um in terms of a long block where you're all together you've got people who perhaps would train together at home but will be spread across different squads and i assume each each isl team has its own training times and and so it's not really possible to keep to your home squad when you're out there how how is that being managed? And and I guess Mel, for you, is there a sense of kind of needing to protect 
coaching secrets. I don't know. I don't know if that's something that, that you think about when you've got so many great swimmers all in one place. Uh, I think so. But I, I think the big thing is it's about the athletes. So what I'm seeing it now is any athlete that comes into the London Raw, they're going to get the raw treatment. Um, I just want every athlete this year to get what they deserve next year. And if they're in my care for six weeks, then I'll give them the best care that I can give them. And I know we, we represent different countries, but you know ultimately it's about the athletes. And I think at this time we should all be helping them to get what they deserve because they're the ones that have missed out these last 18 months. And I think that, yeah, there may be some secrets that, um, I will be sharing with a Kira Tucson or I'll be sharing with a Sydney Pickram or I'll be sharing with a Amre Laveau. But at the end of the day, they'll also be sharing with me, as in what training sets they do, what gym programs they do. So it's a win-win for everybody. And I think if you go into it with a positive mindset, you have belief in yourself, um, you know, they can, they can follow my prescription for six weeks. But, you know, when I go back, they don't get to keep that because that that's me. That's my product, I suppose. So... But I just think it's about getting the athletes at the front of everything, giving the raw in treatment and then wishing them well and making sure they have a good Olympic preparation. So, Rob, I was going to say, even though we're talking about this from a London raw perspective, what about the chances for a whole panoply of, of British swimmers who probably wouldn't otherwise have got the chance? And we, we have so many British representatives right across the board in ISL, which has got to be great for British swimming, hasn't it? Yeah, it is good for British swimming. And, you know, what part of it has been that actually has been the support of British swimming with this as well. Um, I think that they were, they were rightly hesitant with everything that's going on in the world. Um, but then once the, um, you know, once uh, it was pretty obvious that, you know, this is absolutely what the swimmers want, um, then um, certainly the high performance guys at British swimming got right behind this. And, and uh, having their support then allowed a lot more swimmers to be recruited. Um, once particularly once the australians um had to pull out but also you know it wasn't just our team either there you know there was, there was um some of the young potential stars of british swimming in years to come are on some of the other teams now which is it's a fantastic opportunity for them um they will do well they'll do personal best they'll get an incredible experience racing against the world's best um in a year where there is basically no competition so you can't argue with that Let's let's move on and look at the um, at the competition season that's coming up. Then, um, have have between you as as coach, manager, the the team staff, have you set a target for yourselves, Rob? What would you be happy with as a as an achievement for the team this season? Um, I still think we can win the whole thing, um, uh, and that's our target. Uh, we we uh, Mel and I and Stephen and, and the other coaches don't really talk about that. We haven't talked about it as uh, as that's our goal. Um, but uh, from my perspective, that's what we want to achieve. Um, as I said earlier, when, when we had our full team, you know, on paper, it was just an unbelievable team. Yes, we are missing some people and you, you can't replace them. I mean, our athletes and Emma McKee and Kyle Chalmers, Kate Campbell and so forth. But we have an exceptional team and we're going to do everything we can. Um, we have looked at the other teams and um, it's going to be very, very competitive and there's a couple of exceptionally strong teams in there. But, um, you yeah, we can only do the best we can do. Um, as Mel said earlier, there's going to be some uh, some athletes come out and just perform unbelievably fast um and i believe some of the quite a few of those athletes will be on the london raw team so we're we're you know from my perspective aiming high um, um but if we get the best out of our athletes and the best out of our coaches and then our management team um and put in you know the, a superb performance all around throughout this six-week camp into the finals then um we're going to be right up there Mel, would you agree with that? Are you happy with the balance of the team that you've got to play with, you know, to, to take you through the uh, the opening rounds of the season and, and hopefully onwards? Yeah, I mean, I think, like Rob says, really, you know, of course we're going to miss those athletes, but we, um, you know, we've gone, we'll go in as underdogs in some ways and the people that people are rooting for, because we've probably taken uh, the hardest hit through the pandemic. So I think we'll probably have the... Uh, We'll have the fans behind us because I think we, we set out a good expectation last year. We came close last year and um, you know what people like. They like the underdogs. So I think that, you know, on paper we'll have gone from, uh, we'll go in as underdogs and I think that's a nice place to go in. But absolutely I'm committed and the staff are committed to making sure that every round upon round that we um, get the best out of our team. And I think we are, we are incredibly competitive. And I think that... Um, we should be proud of that and we should be proud of the people that we've got and the recruits that we've got and we should be 
proud of the performance that we can potentially pull together. In terms of the of the competition itself, I mean, last year we saw twice in the in the derby and in the final that the Energy Standard were able to overhaul you in the in the skins events at, at the end. Um, obviously, this year the skins are going to be different um, with the the winner of the medley relay getting to pick pick the stroke. Have you already thought about Mel how you will how you will approach that? Will you be adjusting your tactics by match, or do you now have a, a fixed plan? I think the only thing is you've got to win the medley relay, haven't you? <laughs> I think I think we all know the importance of that and what an event that will be to watch. I can already imagine, you know, in terms of um, how fired up everybody's going to be for that one. So I think you have to adjust your tactics and I think we'll know after day one around what selections to make for skins. And But we will be trying to make sure that we get the best possible control off the back of those relays uh, and we will do what we need to do to balance out getting enough points throughout and also giving ourselves the, uh, the best opportunity during those relays to make impact. And what about the, the jackpot time rule? Do you think that will be uh, a factor? I mean, it seems, it seems to me looking from outside looking in that it's probably not going to play a big part, but I don't know what your view uh, is of that innovation. Well, I think the you know, the different rules this year, I think they all, they will, They'll offer different opportunities for different teams. And I think that that is where it does get interesting. And I think that, you know, we looked at last year, if you look at the skins, you know, they were a big part of your technical decisions and a big part of your performance decisions. So I think all the rules this year will offer different advantages for different teams. It's about making sure that you maximise your opportunity through all the events to collect as many points as you can. And that's more complicated this year. And I think it's just about being more thorough with your thought process. And talking of different opportunities, uh, are we going to get a chance to see Adam's freestyle in uh, in action again this year? Have you got any surprises up your sleeve in terms of people trying different events? In the middle of a pandemic, who knows? <laughs> so um, I think what you'll get from the London Roar is if there's an event that needs standing up and it's not your event, you will get people that will stand up and take those points. Every team will have an event whereby they're going to have to fill it or make numbers count and somebody's going to have to step up and do a job in something they're not that comfortable in. So... Um, I think Adam led the way last year with that, you know, 100 freestyle off the back of a, of his other events. you just got to step up and do your bit for the team. And I think that's, um, that is what the Raw do really well. You mentioned uh, middle of the pandemic, which obviously we are still in. Um, Rob, do you think that, that, that COVID-19 and the precautions and protocols around that will have a say in the outcome? I mean, we've already seen Femke Hemskirk have to stay at home for a bit longer, having uh, taken a positive test despite being asymptomatic so are you expecting that to play a part in the in the the way that the preliminary rounds play out uh yeah we certainly we certainly wouldn't be surprised um uh from what i understand everyone's got through the um the the, the covid test on arrival um this last 24 hours but um uh as with all around the world you can't predict that so uh, and, and you look at some of the uh professional leagues in other sports that have happened around the world and um there, there are ongoing positive tests so the reality is um health and safety is is more important than the racing itself um uh not just for the athletes but everyone around them as well so um those precautions are being taken um uh, are well thought through um and um it, it looks like we have a pretty good um uh, bubble here, if, if, if uh, for want of a better word, um, but it's going to be up to every single person involved to adhere to the protocols and so forth. So it's too early to tell, but nothing would surprise us. We're, we're prepared for anything, um, but uh, you know, if 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 there is a, uh, a positive or a couple of positives, which then cause other people to have to isolate and so forth, then it's it's going to have a pretty big impact on a team. So um, uh, every team member understands the importance of that and the importance of the social social distancing and all uh, all the other things that we're required to do uh, to try and minimise the risk. But the risks are still there and um, you know, we, we, we don't underestimate that. And Mel, in terms of the of the team that you've assembled, we, you know, people will know um, Adam Peaty, they'll know James Guy, they'll know Duncan Scott, people like that. Um, they won't necessarily know some of the other up-and-coming swimmers that you've got um, in there, particularly some of the younger Brits that you've brought in. Who do you think we should be looking out for in, in this upcoming season? Um, I'm not really a fan of pointing out people, as in I just think you should, you know, wait and see and see, you know, see who you want to follow and see who you want to track. And um, we've selected the team to fill 
um, spots that we know that are important to us. So I think that I don't want to single anybody out. I just think that um, watch the show and enjoy the people that step up to the arena um, is what I would say. And if I tell you all the names, everybody would say, well, you were wrong about that one. So <laughs> I, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that, I think. Oh, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. So you've got your first match, Mel, coming up this weekend against uh, DC Trident, Aqua Centurions and Iron. Now, Iron were, were strong last year um, no, and uh, have got some, some very strong swimmers. Do you, uh, how do you see that one panning out? Well, this is going to be our biggest challenge because we've still got four people waiting to come in. So we've still got um, some freestyle boys waiting to come in, Tom De- Dean, James Guy. We've still got Fair Anderson waiting to come in and we've still got Holly Hibbert. So we're, we're at our biggest vulnerability i think this weekend and we need to be honest with ourselves around that so we really need to i think we need to feature in that and i think that we need to make sure that we're still seen as a contender off the back of that match and i think that we need to start our momentum but also be aware that we want to build through the rounds and get better and better as we move forward um but this weekend will be our biggest challenge um and we need to be ready for that and and, and that's just part of the plan in terms of their other commitments that they've got going on it's just always been the, the plan that they were going to come in a little bit later on and join the team uh, to be at full strength at the next match. Is that right? Um, yeah, well, just some, some issues in terms of getting them across the pond, um, which we've um, managed to sort out now. So um, just with planning and everything, we've um, they've made the decision to just come out a little bit later. So we've organised that. and um, But yeah, that's kind of how that's going to roll. What I was going to say, Mel, is there obviously no home advantage this year for you, very much a Budapest home advantage. Uh, are you going to miss out on that, that you're not going to have the, the, the roar of the London roar this year? Well, obviously everybody's going to miss the crowd, um, but there isn't going to be any home crowd, is there? So I think it's the crowd that you generate online. I think it's the people that you get interested in your stories. And I think that's the crowd. So I think that like people got behind us when they came to London, uh, I think they should get behind us online and on the social media platforms and just we'll know that you're with us. But I think in terms of the crowd, the, you know, we can't win the crowd this time because there isn't any. So I just think that I just see it as it's the same for everybody. We're all on no home turf, really. So um, bring it on. And Rob, just one final word from you. What can we expect from this ISL season? Uh, expect the unexpected, I think. Um, uh, there are so many unknowns. Um, uh, you, you've addressed a lot of the issues already, you know, the, the potential impact of COVID and things like that. But also the, the athletes are they're all in so many different scenarios in terms of what they've been through over the last six months. We know all their preparations have been, uh, have been um, stilted and, and halted and so forth. But um, we don't know who's in great form right now. I mean, there's certainly been some strong swims in recent weeks uh, in Russia and some other countries, but um, we don't know how some people are going to turn up. So for us, it's about expecting the unexpected. Uh, We'll we'll leave no stone unturned to to get the best out of our team and and produce the best result. As Mel said, it is about building. Big challenge this weekend, um, but it's about building into November and, and through to the finals. Well, at that point, we know you've got a team meeting to get to, so we'll let you both go. But we'll say thank you, Rob. Thank you, Mel, for your time uh, and wish you all the best for the opening match at the weekend. Thank you. That was Mel Marshall and Rob Woodhouse sharing their insight into how the uh, the London team was put together and looking ahead to uh, the first match, which takes place this weekend. Uh, As we said... Uh, London will be up in the the actual the second match of the season against DC Trident, Aqua Centurion and Iron. Uh, and Mel there revealed that they will be without uh, James Guy, uh, Tom Dean, Freya Anton and Holly Hibbert for that match. Who are, they're still in the UK. Uh, Katie, that could be a bit of a blow for that first round. Yeah, I think it does. Um, it Im- impacts a few things. I mean, we're lucky in terms of the women's free- sprint freestyle. We've still got Anna. And there's a few other girls that can really step up in sprint freestyle. Marie Wattel, who was one of our highest scorers last year, um, is out there, which is great. Siobhan Marie O'Connor is a great sprint freestyler. So f- from that perspective, I think we'll be all right. Perhaps a bit of a struggle in, in the women's 200 and 400 free. Um, not immediately obvious who will be stepping up. But um, as we've discussed, certainly um, it might be one of those events where there are a few surprises. Um, I think... James Guy brings such a lot to a team that, it, that it's going to be a real shame to have to kick things off without him. And I'm sure he'll be disappointed to be missing out on a, a match. And, you know, as uh, all of us, I think we're really excited to see what Tom Dean does. So we'll just have to wait a bit longer um, to get the Tom Dean fix. 
Well, I think we we were speculating that we might see uh, Amy Wilmot and uh, Sydney Pickram in the 400 free for the ladies with no Holly. Uh, it may well be that one, one of them would have swum it anyway, but um, Holly was such a great, uh, well, a bit of a breakout in the short course last year. So, um, yeah, she'll be missed in this first round. Emily Large, potentially. That, yeah, that another, another option, definitely. So, I mean, Mel was saying that there'll be a time when people have got to step up and they're going to have to do that straight away. Um, in terms of the result this weekend, I mean, Mel thought, they would be vulnerable, Bob, but uh, they're probably still the favourites for this match. Yeah, I, I think they've got enough depth there. As we mentioned, um, obviously a couple of, well, more than a couple of key swimmers not involved, but, um, you know, there's some big hitters still in that lineup. And I think there are some swimmers, as I mentioned, who are making their debuts here. We don't quite know what they're going to do till they get into the pool, but by reputation and what they've done the last couple of years, I think there's quite enough swimmers on that roster to pick up the slack. There might be a couple of events where they they lack a little bit, but overall, uh, I think there's still probably just about enough there to win the weekend. And last year, Iron were, uh, well, were the third best of the European uh, teams, but they weren't that far behind uh, Energy in London. Uh, when it came to the final crunch, they've they've still got Renomi Krumawijoyo, still got Katinka Hoshu, but they've lost Vladimir Moritzov to, um, to Tokyo this year. Uh, that's probably a big loss for them, Katie. Yeah, I think so, because I think um, just the way it seems to work, it, sprint points are, are just really key. Um, they count so much towards the relays and then ultimately to the skins. And I think the whole series last year was won and lost on the skins. Um, so if you've got someone who can step up and put together a, a good 50, which he can do in practically any stroke, then um, I think I think that'll be a really big loss. Yes, it will. I mean, you, you say he probably would be their go-to swimmer in any stroke uh, for the skins. So uh, a big pickup for uh, the Tokyo Frog Kings. Um, Iron have also got uh, Ross Murdoch on their, their roster, Bob. So uh, I'm sure yeah. you'll be keeping an eye on what he's up to. No, Ross, still plenty left in the tank from him. Still capable of knocking out a really good 200 breasts. So we'll see how he does. And of course, 100 breasts too. Of the of the other two teams, Katie, though, my take on it is that the Aqua were the weakest of the European teams last year, and looking at the, the the teams this year, you know, I think I think they'll probably be in a similar sort of position. Iron, we we think are slightly weaker, maybe on paper than last year. And DC, uh, they've lost Katie Ledecky, who was you know obviously as a standout. They've lost Siobhan Hockey to um, to uh, Energy this year, so they're they're maybe uh, the weakest of the US teams. But you can't count out count them out because of the the sort of NC2A experience and that racing pedigree. Yeah, I think that will actually be a massive factor because there are so many more swimmers who've joined the ISL for this season. Um, it's quite hard for us as as Brits, not really necessarily understanding yards times and what they mean, to know how how good short course swimmers uh, a lot of the US swimmers are and so I think um, it will be quite hard to really get the measure of some of the US teams until we've seen them probably go through the first couple of rounds of the ISL um, just to work out really what our strengths and weaknesses but as you say I think Siobhan Hohi is a real loss um, and and a great pickup for energy because uh, she I think she did the fastest 200 freestyle of, of the whole of the ISL last year and is pretty invaluable across medley freestyle and, and can do a decent fly as well. So she'll be, I'm sure she'll be a really high scorer. Well, they have, they have names in there that, that, that people might recognize from, from us teams like Zach Apple, uh, Amy Bilquist, Zane Growth, who we've seen on relays for the U S and obviously they have that, um, that NC 2 a pedigree. So it can't be counted out, but um, where, where are we putting our money? for this weekend's match do we think i mean thinking about um putting stuff together for this podcast and before we'd spoken to mel i'd concluded that i thought it would be a raw versus iron uh battle really out of the four teams that are in it uh the the loss of those four swimmers could sway it but uh which way do you think it's going to go bob yeah um i think you're right i can't, I can't receive beyond that uh, at all i think it, that's going to be the likely outcome and um they, they seem to be on paper the two strongest units, even with the lack of uh, those four swimmers we talked about. Katie, are you going to be are you going to plump for a London win? I mean, obviously, obviously, I'm saying it's a London win. I think I, I do think the loss of those four swimmers hurts. I think they are versatile and valuable, um, and I, I think it's a real shame. 
but I still think uh, I still think London looks like the strongest team. Okay. Look at so, sorry, I was about to say I'm looking looking at the first uh, quartet though, and I think we should highlight the fact that we've got um, some good young Brits on the New York Breakers going in the first matchup. Um, people who've really got a chance to step up from junior ranks to senior ranks here. Matt Richards is in there. Jacob Whittle is in there. I think we'll see something special from Joe Litchfield this year as well. Uh, and of course, James Wilby's on that team as well. There's, there's a lot of Brits on the New York Breakers team, including on the official listing, somebody called Renshaw doesn't have a first name. <laughs> well, that'll be uh, that'll be Molly, of course, who uh, has something of a short course pedigree. Let's face it, she was a, a world short course champion uh, not very long ago, uh, picked up by by New York. Uh, as you say, they've got eight Brits on on their uh, on their roster. They'll be up against uh, LA Current, Cali Condors, and Energy Standard in the first match of the ISL season. Uh, it's difficult, really, Casey Bob, to look past Energy Standard for. Um, for this season in its entirety, given the strength they've got on on offer. Yeah, I think they've got they've got they've got the strength in all the right places. I think they have a real um, there's there's not really a bad option for them in the skins, and they've probably got enough to put together a winning medley relay teams on both sides. Um, so I think they've built their teams really well. Um, I think it does massively help having won the ISL in the first year. I think that's a real um, a real plus for them because I think it would have been really helpful for recruiting um, when you come to the next years. But um, there's still, you know, if, if, if we had all our Australians in the London Raw team, um, I think we would be as good, if not slightly better. Um, and I still think the London Raw team looks looks really, really strong for this year. So um, let's not count anyone out yet. Well, in that first match, we'll also get the chance to see uh, Caleb Dressel in action. He was one of the superstars in the ISL last year, as he is uh, whenever he swims. Um, so what he does for Cali could be quite interesting uh, in setting up their season. You know, this is not an individual event. It is a team event. But um, we saw how uh, one person can really influence it if they're uh, if they're good in the in the skins particularly and uh, the impact they can have on relays and so on uh, he's probably the type of swimmer that could that can swing a whole match uh, he's another one where you could probably put him in any stroke on the skins and he'll be competitive um, so I'm really excited about seeing him in action and then one point I wanted to raise uh, about him or indeed you know, a couple of other people who are swimming is that the uh, the 100 IM has been added um, this year which isn't an event we get to see them swim a lot so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my neck out I think the world record will go in the 100 IM at some point during this this series uh, whether it's Dressel or, or Vladimir Moritzov who holds it now or maybe it's someone like Michael pull, Andrew yeah, yeah it's quite a fast pull it is pull. so there you go that's my prediction uh, I'm going to stick my neck out and say that that world record will go <laughs> I think that world record will go more than once <laughs> I think you could be right but um, I think it's going to be really exciting to, to watch uh watch them them have a go at it because yeah it's an event we don't see some of those top guys from very often so one to look out for also I, i'd say about kelly condors be careful not to just concentrate on caleb dressel they've got a very strong women's lineup there too some really strong swimmers in their in their female lineup well yeah the king's Lily in King. there uh Schmollig is in there Alison schmidt there's a lot of big names in there yeah they are they are stronger i think than last year um and then they could mount a bit of a challenge. So, yeah, keep an eye out how they go against Standard this weekend, and um, and then we'll see where we go from there. Now, we've mentioned uh, a few Brits who are on other teams. Um, we're not entirely raw focused. There's there's somebody uh, on on the Iron roster that we'll see in this first match, Casey, that you and I had spoken about that we thought might have been a dark horse for Olympic trials uh, had they taken place, which is um, uh, Bella Hindley. So, uh, someone we should keep an eye on. Do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, she so um, Bella was swam at Chelsea and Westminster, I think, in in London, and then uh, has just finished her degree at Yale in the US. So she's got some experience of um, the NCAA system, and then she's also been training with a pro group, I think, out in Tennessee, and has a really, really good hundred free and fifty free. Um, so will be great on relays, and is also pretty pretty handy on sprint, backstroke, and fly. Um, we talked about her just in the context of perhaps sneaking in if we if we if we put in a GB four by one relay for the Olympics, which we still don't know if they're going to try and try and get a place. But um, 
I think she'd certainly be a dark horse of finishing off that that relay. Well, keep an eye out for her uh, in this in this weekend's match. Now, uh, when we were speaking to to Mel and Rob, Bob, you made the point about um, bringing in a whole load of of young Brits, um, but it, you know they're they're spread across a number of teams, as we say. Uh, there's there's a number obviously on on uh, on the London Raw roster, but but right across uh, you know seven of the teams, um, and it's it's a great opportunity for those young swimmers to get. Uh, experience and, and maybe with with the withdrawals some people coming in who wouldn't have got that chance maybe in a normal year absolutely and on so many levels this is really important because a lot of the swimmers i'll give you an example jay Elliott, for example with toronto has not had a chance to swim this year at all with sheffield because they haven't had a pool i know he does a, he does bar work to to make ends meet um actually being part of the isl gives him you know a reasonable income for a little while gives him that extra incentive he could easily have given up this year isl has given him a chance to potentially progress into 2021 hopefully give himself a chance of uh, knocking on the door for the olympics next year so this is in some cases he, he's not one of the younger people that we're talking about but nonetheless he's a brit that's made it onto one of the rosters here and it's very key that these people get a chance to to show what they could do on a world stage before obviously in, inevitably retiring at some point in the next couple of years, but he's got another year's worth of another lease of life, if you like, in swimming for another 12 months. Well, that's a fantastic opportunity for him and indeed for everybody else. Um, plenty that we've pondered on this podcast. Time, I think, to draw things to a close. Uh, Casey, one final thought from you. What are, what are you most looking forward to this weekend? Uh, I think I'm looking forward to seeing some of the new rules come in. Um, I want to see how it plays out in terms of medley relays. I think we'll get quite a lot of, of an idea of team tactics and who's strong and who's weak. Um, and I always enjoy the skins. And Bob, for you, your your main thing you're looking forward to this weekend? I hope, well, I hope the we first weekend is not as chaotic as the last first weekend was. That's all I'll say. Well, hopefully they will have learnt lessons. Uh, I'm just keen to see uh, see some swimming really because we've been we've been starved all year and it's fantastic to see some competition taking place uh bob katie thank you as ever for your inputs thank you thank you uh we'll be back uh next week after the first round matches to uh, have a look at what's happened uh mull over what happened with london in their match um We'll be joined by somebody from the team. We don't know who, but uh, it will depend on, on what happens. Um, so we'll get some insight from inside the London camp. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you want to get in contact, you can find me on Twitter at Poolboy or on Facebook and Instagram at Poolboy UK. Uh, there is a link in the description to this podcast if you want to send us a voice message. If you want to ask a question, uh, you can be on the podcast if you follow that link uh, and leave us a message. Uh, or if you want to send an email, it's poolboy.co.uk forward slash contact. So we're really excited about uh, the ISL season two getting underway. Uh, and we'll be back next week to, uh, to see how it went. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the London Raw podcast by Paul Boy. For more episodes, visit www.poolboy.co.uk slash raw.